Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome back from our telethon this yeah. weekend. Oh, goodness. I hear myself. Okay, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> all right, make sure all of our audio settings are good to go. Yes, excellent. Hey, Karen, good to see you. Hello. Oh, thanks for sharing. So, yes, welcome to Lo-Fi History. We have not had a Lo-Fi History in a whole month. Wow. So we are here to answer your, well, Glenn and Marie are here to answer your history questions. I am Libba. Uh, usually we're, uh, we're dressed in some fancy costumes. Glenn, uh, what costume are you wearing today? I'm wearing a 100% wool sweater to represent the fantastic and very important history of the wool trade <laughs> in Europe <laughs> in the medieval period. It led to wars, the Hundred Years' War, one could argue. It helped finance the English invasion and attempted overthrow of the French crown. I see. And it also keeps one incredibly warm and stylish in the cool winter months. Even when you're wet. Even, Even when, when you're, you're wet. wet. Yeah. And that is why most military uniforms are made out of wool. And it's durable. And nice. it will catch yes. on fire if you stand next to a fire. That's why like, ladies like to have wool aprons, <laughs> so we don't catch ourselves on fire That's while right. cooking. Now, let me check, check, check. That's my mic. Because polyester sweaters, if they get too warm, they'll just Ooh. melt to you and burn your skin, and you'll have to go to the hospital and have it chemically peeled off, and it's, it's excruciating. Nobody here. wants I that. I hear that's bad. <laughs> so wear wool, kids. Yeah. All right, I think we're I think we're all good to start audio wise and everything. Yay. I see Alma is Hello. here. Hello, Hello, Alma. Olivia is also here. Yay. Hello, Olivia. Yay. And Josh is here. Hello, Josh. Hello. <laughs> now we have some questions to catch up on from last time, but before we dive into that, Marie, tell us about what you are wearing today. So I am wearing my 1880s ensemble. Mm -hmm. I, I call it my engagement ensemble because I made this for a photo shoot uh, to commemorate my engagement. Aww. <laughs> yes. Um, I got very excited because I got an embroidery machine. Mm -hmm. uh, so I embroidered my, my cuffs and around the neck. I was basing it off of an ensemble that was also from the 1880s that I found at the Philadelphia Museum. Nice. Uh, so I was re basically trying to recreate that with a little bit of my own elements. Um, I did not recreate the floral embroidery exactly, but I put it on the same place as on the dress. Nice. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. And I'm wearing a chemisette with this. So usually um, this could be worn as like a dinner outfit, a dinner jacket, a uh, dinner ensemble. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I have a chemisette because we are, we are talking about history. So I figured this is an academic, uh, not, not necessarily a dinner Yes. Today. Is it? Is it a dicky? It is. It's a chemisette, which it's a, basically it's means it's a dicky. Yeah, nice. <laughs> but the chemisette sounds so much more. Fancy. It really does. Yeah, it really does. Who a chemisette? Who? No one has those anymore. Yeah. Now, uh, speaking of fashion, you actually have a live stream program tomorrow that anyone can join, and that is going to be um, about the winter fashions of the Victorian era. So uh, this is going to be super fun. You can learn all the ways to stay warm and fashionable. We talk <laughs> during about the wool. Now, yes. is this going to be like also include like the little poppers in Victorian England that have to wrap themselves up in newspaper to stay warm because they're so poor? No, it's more middle class. Oh, yeah. yeah. I like more middle class fashion. I like street urchin newspaper warmth. But, but <laughs> street well, urchin but, but you should still tune in to watch because yeah. that'll yes. still be interesting. But. There's actually a very interesting historical reenactment group based out of London. I know who you're talking about. Called the Victorian Unwashed. They're so good. They are very good. Oh, cool. They look so good. Yeah. They like rub the dirt in their everything. Yes. Ah. They, they, <laughs> and their, their clothes, you know, all the clothing I would venture to say that Marie and I have is pretty nice and pristine and yeah. we like to keep it nice. But these guys, yeah. they use it, they wear it. It is threadbare there are patches everywhere there are <laughs> holes the hats are all crumpled yeah. they, they look right yes i have a couple work dresses that i'm actually very proud that i've like busted seams on yeah nice. and like have not <laughs> repaired them for the purpose of it looking right. worn yeah, we, we tend to get excited when we like pop a button or rip a seam on our work on our workaday clothes or the, or the military clothes. Yeah. It's like, check it out! I tore a hole and it's all muddy. Yeah. Nice, it's great. <laughs> it's authentic. Authentic. I love it. I have it. sweat stains. That's right. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> but not on something like this. Not on something like this. Heavens this is very. No. This is. I would keep this very pristine. Yes. 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 This is not working class. This is probably one of the fancier outfits that I have made. Ooh. Because of all the embroidery. Oh yeah. It. 
Well, uh, Olivia says it's snowing where they are. Oh, <laughs> oh. So, uh, fun. So they need some. I keep wanting it to snow here. I know. It's, I mean, who knows? We never really know we if it's going to snow in Georgia. <laughs> right. And whatever snow is in Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say when it snows, I'm going to make pancakes and have some delicious New York syrup with them. Ooh, Ooh. that's right, Olivia. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> who gifted us that. Yeah. I still have some left. I'm saving it. Oh, yeah. Nice. I do, too. I do, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I see we've also got. Um, oh, we got some questions uh, in the queue as well. So why don't we dive right in? Now, today we do need to end a little bit uh, early today. Glenn's got to head somewhere. So everybody go. blame Glenn. <laughs> I got to meet a guy about a thing. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but we did want to um, get to the questions we had last week. And since Josh is here, um, let's dive into uh, Josh's question. For, well, not last week, last month. Ah. Um, last time. Yes, last, last time. time. Last time on the Fi <laughs> <Yes>. History. <gasps> Freed is here as well. Hello. Oh, we haven't seen you in so long. <laughs> so good to see you, Freed. Uh, Freed says, I finally get to catch on your streams again. No more social engagements on Tuesday evening. So cheers to many more streams. Yes. Yay. Yes. That's awesome. That's awesome. Now, just so you know, we are doing a monthly format with Lo-Fi History, but we do a whole lot uh, more than Lo-Fi History, of course. So if you ever want to catch us on our uh, monthly live streams as well. And of course, you can always become a digital member and now is probably the best time ever to become a digital member because they're only $20. Whoa, what that a deal. Is an incredible deal. It really is. We're practically throwing these memberships to people. So uh, you can get them for $20 uh, through December 24th. You can't even buy a third of a piece of plywood for that. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not with today's prices. Yeah. <laughs> so if you want to become a digital member, uh, you can go to www.negahc.org slash member and Yay. become a digital member for only $20, which is pretty awesome. Good deal. For but, a membership. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Whole year. Yeah. Karen says it's a steal of a deal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so let's get to last time. Um, we had a question from Josh. What if, aha, uh -huh, wait, I have to get my what if uh, graphic ready. So Josh is king of the what if question. So what if uh, the 22nd Amendment never passed? Which presidents following its failure to pass might have tried for a third term or more? Ooh. Hmm. Who so was course, popular enough to actually get a third term? Yeah, so, hmm. Now, of course, I feel the 22nd like people would have Amendment. Tried, do we like want to try? Uh, maybe context clues are enough. Yes. Oh, so, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. What is the 22nd so Amendment? So there was no. So, so the 22nd Amendment limits the number of terms and the amount of time that a person can serve in the office of President of the United States. Because FDR made it to where we had to have a rule. Well, yes, yes because there there wasn't a rule before. People mostly people totally followed the precedent of the first president. <laughs> George Washington, uh, who served only two terms and then said, I will serve no more, even though he could have probably easily been elected to a third term. He oh, said, yeah. nope, I'm, he, George <laughs> I'm Washington good. was super aware that everything he did was setting a precedent yes, for what that right. office was going to be. So he said two terms and that's it. And people pretty much followed that voluntarily, mm -hmm. right? As a, as a matter of tradition until we get to, to old FDR. Oh, now, yeah. There were some things going on in the country that there, made him think. Just a few. <laughs> World War Twice, for one. Yeah. Great Depression. Great Depression, all those things. Um, lots, of, lots of stuff going on. Yeah. So he, he was elected for an unprecedented four terms, but he didn't serve very much of his fourth term uh, because he died in Warm yeah. Springs, Georgia. So, but, but, sh but soon after he passed, they decided, you know, that's, that's a long time. Maybe we should have like a rule so that we can like hold people to it rather than just a tradition that right. people generally honor. But so, I would have expected that to be like a big deal from the beginning because if you don't want a, a tyrant, you know, someone who's going to stay in office forever. Well, it's interesting. The Confederate Constitution <laughs> set a limit huh. uh, for the, the Confederate president was to serve only one six year term. Oh, interesting. Hmm. But yeah, that. It's, but anyway, but you're yeah. right. I mean, let me, so so we very and we very much depended upon that that ideal set by George Washington. Yeah. But who 
after the 22nd would have done it. I think that the fact is that FDR's four terms kind of left a bad enough taste in people's mouth that they did pass uh -huh. the amendment. So even yeah. if the amendment hadn't passed, I think after that, people still would have been very cautious yeah. mm -hmm. uh, about that sort of thing. Yeah. And, and let's see, between FDR, what two-term president could have or would have wanted to serve a third term? A lot of times after they get to the second one, they're like, you know what? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. I'm going to head is, out. Um, this is difficult. You're like, this gosh, is a lot. I, I don't think anyone would have wanted to, Yeah. honestly. Um, I, I can't the think. The only person, well, he was really popular first go around. Second term, not as much was Reagan, but he was already so old. No, right? no. Because he was not popular at the second go around at the end. No president gets out of their second term <laughs> nearly as popular as they went into their first. Mm -hmm. Not even George Washington, right? People were burning his effigy at the yeah. end of Washington's second term. He wasn't pretty. Washington himself. So yeah, there's I don't think I'm gonna I'm gonna say no one. Yeah. Gosh, that's that's my <laughs> official answer. Um because there would have to be like a giant crisis in which someone would be have to like provide stability like FDR yeah. did. It was really as right. a, a perfect circumstance for that to actually happen and to apply where the country felt like they needed some sort of stability mm -hmm. when everything else was kind of falling to yeah. bits. Mm -hmm. We can't deal with an election right now. Well, no, yeah. see, that, that's, that's why I personally am somewhat critical of FDR's insistence on running for a third and then a fourth term. Uh -huh. Because if we could hold an election in 1864, <laughs> right. in the middle of a civil war mm -hmm. where our country was being torn apart over a great many important issues. If we, if our system and our people had the courage to have an election then, FDR, someone yeah. could have stepped in no, and, and carried us point. on through World yeah. War II. Yes, very um, good point. Because <laughs> um, they had to, like, you know, someone had to step in after he died right. and, and kind of assume the reins when right. they were not necessarily expecting to. But yes, yeah. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little ambivalent towards FDR sometimes, but that is a story for another day. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last time we also had a question from um, G. Saxena on YouTube. Um what kind of communications did the South and the North use on warships in the Civil War? That's a cool yeah. question. I've never thought about that. The Glenn, same, take it away. No, no. <laughs> warships specifically is like because like I mean, there's lots of different communications, but specifically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they used signal flags. Okay. Because that's that's the uh, that is the standard means of communication for navies for a few hundred years, right? This is way before radio, telegraph was wired. Um, at night, if you could use it, they would use uh, lantern signals. Oh. But for example, mo modern major navies had entire code books, right? So that you would put out letter and number flags. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a usually the job of a subordinate officer who's, who was the signal officer. They had to memorize all these codes, and, and there was a big book of codes because they had to cover, theoretically, every eventuality. <laughs> Fall in line, go to the right, uh, <laughs> attack X ship in line. And so they would have to know the code, go get the right flags out, and run these flags up, up one of the masts, and then the ships around it would see those signals and go, oh, okay, so I'm supposed to do this and do that. Yes, they, um, and so... Did That's I, how they communicated right up correct? to the American Civil War. These flags, kind of flags? flags like that, okay. yes. There yeah. is a universal uh, multinational flag agreement for that represents specific letters and numbers. But of course, just like you know, it's it's the alphabet, right? Yeah. It's, it's alphanumeric. But but each country uses its own language and uses its own codes, so they can't read what the what the yeah. other the opponent's code is supposed oh, to be. Oh, okay. They, also, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, they would also use signal flags on land. And there was this one time I was at a living history event at Lookout Mountain in Tennessee uh, for the Battle Above the Clouds, Battle of Chattanooga, and we were up on top of the mountain, and they had signal flags, and then they were signaling down to like people on. In, in the valley uh, mm -hmm. of, of the mountain and just to see them communicate was really cool right because like you had to have like your binoculars out and you're like where is where is the flag where because right. like you had to figure out where the flag was first. and then and see, then to yeah. have to signal and figure out what they were saying but it was really really cool and but they really used cool. those they used flag signals they still use them up until 
through World War II. Oh, wow. When they were wanting, you know, if a fleet's moving, this is before satellite imagery could capture where a fleet was. And if you wanted your fleet's presence to remain secret, the last thing you wanted to do was send out radio transmissions. Yeah. But the ship still had to communicate, and they would use either flags or sem- Morse code, right, with, with mm-hmm. lights at night. And so it's a, still a very recent phenomenon. Same thing they did in the American Civil War, Napoleonic Wars, Revolutionary War, all the way back. Nice. That, that was a cool question. All right. I think we're ready to go into today's questions. Nice. I see our okay. first question is from Alma. Uh, hey. Alma says, greetings from San Diego. Gabby watched uh, Sarafina, the movie musical with Whoopi Goldberg over the weekend. I'm not familiar with that. I'm also um, not familiar with that. So, oh, and apparently it, it takes place during apartheid. So she wants to know about apartheid. When did it start and why? I am not super familiar with this subject, but it seems like a, a really fascinating subject and something we should cover for sure. Um, who among you is somewhat familiar with apartheid? I mean, I know I know what it I, is. I, I am also aware of it, but I'm not. I don't think I can give you a date of when it yeah, started. So, uh, so South Africa, going all the way back to the imperial days in the continent of Africa, um, folks had moved in. Europeans generally therefore white um particularly dutch dutch and dutch and english and english so yes the dutch slash germans had gone in and then the english had english were trying to get a hold of everything um the boer war happens lots of things happen <laughs> but lot going on. yeah but the uh, the government in south africa therefore was controlled by uh the white population of dutch and english descent um the vast population percentage was native Africans, mm-hmm. but the controlling class, I mean, they're, they're native Africans too. They'd lived there for several generations by this point, but they controlled it. And so apartheid is basically the control of the country by a significant minority based purely on race. Mm-hmm. And so the struggles there take place between the majority African population trying to have more political enfranchisement, more say, and back and forth. You know, Nelson Mandela is is mixed up in all of this. And uh, there was a lot of international pressure over a series of years for South Africa to end this and expand voting rights and political enfranchisement to the African uh, majority population. And they've more or less eventually gotten there. It's still a, quite frankly, quite frankly it's still a big mess. Mm. All that to say, I have not seen the musical. Yeah, yeah. So this was Sarafina. I'm just going to look that up really yeah. quick. Sarafina yeah. the musical. So this was in 1992. Interesting. I I did not come across that, but um that's that's interesting. All right, cool. Noted. Thank you, Gabby. Thank you. I see um let's see going through the chat. Ah, Olivia says, I have a few questions. Um, yeah. <laughs> I bet you do. Uh, Olivia says, I know Josh usually does the what ifs today, uh, but, oh, don't worry. We can we can definitely throw in a what if uh, for you <laughs> as well. <laughs> so um, Olivia asks, what if Napoleon had won the battle of, oh, I don't know how to say this, Trafalgar. Uh, Trafalgar. 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 Um, and could be, and could have avoided the continental system. Okay, I'm going to need some context. Okay. <laughs> there are the Napoleonic Wars. The French are dominant on the continent because Napoleon is whopping and whooping everybody on mainland Europe. All right. The English at, uh, stand alone against him. They're the only country who at one point didn't ally with him. Small army, lots of money, super powerful navy. Napoleon does not have much of a navy. His main ally is, nominally, Spain, which does have a significant navy, and he's trying to build up the French navy to compete with the British. Napoleon himself said, I am a hero on land and a coward at sea. Because he knew the (laughs) French and the Spanish navies were not nearly as good technologically, um, morale-wise, and performance-wise as the British navy. The British navy was tops. And so, at Trafalgar, this is the penultimate battle between Napoleon's sea forces and England's sea forces. Uh, Admiral Nelson leads the British to victory. He is killed in the battle, making him the perfect martyr. There's a gigantic column in England, Trafalgar's, uh, Nelson's column in Trafalgar Square. I've been there. It's a cool cool spot. He's way up there. 
Very tall. Um, but he is the national hero. So what Trafalgar does is it basically crushes Napoleon's efforts to accumulate and succeed in sea power. And for the rest of the Napoleonic Wars, whatever ships he has are more or less bottled up in port. And England loves it. Yes. They <laughs> like, get... it's a national, like, hero day. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. It's big time. Yes. So. Big morale boost for England. If if Nelson had lost and uh, Napoleon's navy had won at Trafalgar, Napoleon's navy would have been poised to then invade England. This was always his grand scheme, right? Is to invade across the channel into England. Let's assume that he could have pulled that off and his barges full of ships, excuse me, barges full of troops, convoyed by his French and Spanish ships, could have made it to England. England would have fought tooth and nail to the last five-year-old child fighting against Napoleon, right? There's no way he could have come ashore in England and won. That's even if he had obliterated the British Navy. England and France are centuries old enemies. Hmm. And, and, um, the British Navy was still bigger. Even though the mass of the forces in the Mediterranean were there at Trafalgar, the British still had way more ships. They would have simply assembled another fleet gone against Napoleon and probably beat him again. The ship, uh, Napoleon's ships at Trafalgar were basically all of Napoleon's ships, right? The British had ships all over the world and they could have assembled another fleet and probably crushed him. So, uh, Trying to invade England does not generally work out. Right. Uh, only one, well, a couple of guys pulled it off. But, you know, not for a thousand years. No, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's been a couple thousand years <laughs> since that's the Spanish Armada tried. That didn't work. Yeah. So, um, so I don't. I, short term, it may have made a difference, but in the long term, I don't think it's going. The British Navy is simply too powerful and simply too big. That's a great question, though, Olivia. Thank you. And I, I see that we have a. Um, oh, oh, cool. Karen's just uh, sharing. Uh, Karen says, "I just got a catalog for trips being run in 2022 by the Smithsonian, Smithsonian that has a perfect trip for Glenn, a week in Normandy, including D-Day sites and the Bayou Tapestry." <laughs> Need to get on it, Glenn. That would be five, but it's expensive. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> And uh, Karen also mentioned that uh, Juliet Lowe did indeed teach the Girl Scouts uh, flag signaling as well. I have wanted to learn that myself so I can demonstrate that. So (laughs) good reminder. (laughs) But yeah, I saw that in the uh, Girl Scout handbook from like, I think the one I have was like 1920, which is really cool. Um, And going back to the Civil War, uh, Freed asked about um, naval battles during the Civil War. He didn't realize that there were naval battles in the American Civil War. And I mean, I'm, I'm sure many Americans don't even realize <laughs> that. Um, but these were really, really important. Um, yeah. Glenn, can you sort of talk, speak to the... Uh, I've, I've got some pictures of the monitor to show. Yes. I thought that would be cool. So, and then the Merrimack. Okay, so we have to define our terms when we say a battle in the Civil War. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing approaching a fleet action. Not yeah. even close. Now, right. what when is we, a fleet action A like? fleet action is when multiple ships, like 10 or 15 or 20 from each side, have at each other in okay. the open sea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nothing like that. The naval battles of the American Civil War usually involved between one and five ships per side. And those five ships per side are on the extreme far end. So the ones we think of are usually inshore. They're all inshore actions. Mm-hmm. Um Generally around ports because General, of blockades. Generally around ports. Along rivers like the Mississippi, the Tennessee, um, they have monitor, uh, They have gunships and monitors that are mostly used to bombard shore positions, right? That's where most of your naval Vicksburg. gunboats... Right, Vicksburg, and, and here... Is this... Uh, this is Battle of Mobile Bay? Yeah, this is Mobile. So, so Farragut's trying to take Mobile Bay... And you notice that all those ships there, all those ships are American ships. Uh, excuse me, they're United States ships. <laughs> you have to specify. Those yes, I have to specify. They're United States ships. <laughs> that fort <clears throat> is a Confederate position. So most of the naval battles. Is that Fort Moultrie? 
I don't know. Not if it's it? Mobile Bay. Oh, okay. Um, but if it's um, but naval battles usually means the United States Navy forcing its way past a fortified position or moving up a river and bombarding a fortified position. There were a couple of famous ship-on-ship -ship action, actions like the Monitor and the Merrimack. Yeah. Um, Here's the oh, and and something to point out is that you might not be aware of is the ironclad um, yes. during mm -hmm. the American Civil War. So we'll show you um, a few different types of ships, but you can see in this picture, sort of at the bottom, you see I the ironclad that's <laughs> clad with iron. <laughs> 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 that sort of has that strange shape, almost like a mix between a boat and a submarine. And there then was of course, an attempt at submarine warfare. Yeah. It did not end well. Yeah. And then you've got the more like, I don't know what the classic... <laughs> What looked like pirate three, ships, yeah, to me. Three, yes. three masted, yeah, three yeah. masted wooden ships. But then there were these. Uh, the Monitor was a really cool ship because it had a revolving turret uh, that you see in the middle, um, which has become standard on naval uh, battleships ever since. Yeah, and I thought I love this picture in particular because this is actually on the Monitor, so you can see the turret. Um, you might also notice that uh, there are African Americans serving in the Navy and. Um, I, I learned when I was working at the National Civil War Naval <laughs> Museum um, that the Navy was uh, sort of among the first to have soldiers of, uh, of different backgrounds on ships, so African Americans serving alongside um, Irish and, and other uh, whites, and um, I thought that was really cool because they also would be given uh, around the same pension, right. um, too. Well, really uh, yeah, cool. the U.S. Navy... Uh, for the enlisted, not the not the officer corps, but the enlisted men in the U.S. Navy, uh, it was a uh, de not not even say it wasn't desegregated because that implies at some point it was segregated. Right. <laughs> it was not segregated until the 1870s or 80s, I believe. Wow. So all through the American Revolution, the War of 1812, and up through the Civil War, and for enlisted men, the pay rates were the same. Uh, the job duty, the duties were the same. There was no, well, you have to be cooks or this or that. It was because they needed they needed people to run the ships, and they couldn't be picky because it, they uh, um, trained sailors, competent sailors were at a premium, mm -hmm. and so they would just get men wherever they could. And something else I wanted to show uh, show and share off was. Uh, <laughs> Show off and share. That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> was that um, when I worked at the National Civil War Naval Museum, um, if you ever, it's in Columbus, Georgia, and um, if you ever get a chance uh, to go, I highly recommend it. Um, they actually have um, what's left, the hull of a Confederate ironclad. This was the CSS Jackson, also known as the CSS Muskogee. I mean, this thing is like 250 Oh, it's feet giant, long. yeah. And what was amazing is that when you go into that exhibit, so this was um, burned. This was never, uh, this ship was never actually used. It was built up and then it was burned by the Confederates so that the, the Union would not get a hand <laughs> right. hold of it. And, but you can still smell the burnt wood smell when you go, even oh, though this wow. has been lifted from the Chattahoochee River and... Uh, I mean, that is, that's quite a connection to history when you can right. smell it. So yeah. <laughs> this right. is really cool. Just yeah. want to mention that. Yeah. And, and Freed, all these, all these ironclads are not open, not ocean going vessels. They are coastal or river vessels. They are not seaworthy, right? The first seaworthy ironclad was the HMS Warrior from the British, uh, which you can still go see today because it's there at Portsmouth right next to the Victory, which yeah. was at Trafalgar. Woo, full circle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Freed says that um, that uh, he had never learned about the naval battle of the Civil War, that they only teach the abridged version of the war on <laughs> land and the political goings on. So, so yeah, that, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> Also, I remember the name of the fort yeah. in Mobile, and it's Morgan, not Moultrie. Oh, that's, that's right. I got my M1s Good mixed job. up. Thank you, because I've been there. Yes. It's still bombed out. They did not like right. rebuild any of it. I call it uh, die at your own risk, or because uh, they, they just let you explore. You can just climb. <laughs> it's so, it's yes. very fun. Uh, there's no lights in some of the dark parts. Uh, you just kind of go, and you just feel around until yeah. you get your way out. You get hurt. It's your business. It's, that's the what they tell you. Nice. But it's really fun. You should go there, and it, it's a beautiful... 
a view from because you can see that you have the Gulf of Mexico and you have the bay and you're like, ah, oh, I see why this is a very good position that you would want yes. yeah. for a naval battle. And that someone else would want. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I see Richard's in the chat as well. Hello, Richard. Hey, Richard. Richard is one of our one, uh, wonderful living history interpreters. And yes, he was he was saying Mobile's forts were Gaines and Morgan. So, yep. There we go. All right, so Josh has two questions for us, and um, depending on how long uh, it takes to answer these, these, these may be our last questions, just because Blaine has to All head right. out early. I've got, a, I've got a little bit. Okay, little good. Bit. Let us know. Let us know. Okay, so Josh asks, what if Italy remained neutral in World War I? Would the Central Powers have an easier time or still be in the same place as they were in real life? <laughs> so what if Italy remained neutral in World War I? So what... What kind of power did Italy have in World War One? Sort of give us a an idea. Some Not context. much. Not really. They, they didn't do a whole lot. They didn't do a whole lot. All they did really was draw Austro-Hungarian forces off the Eastern Front uh, to the Asanso River Front. Um, and bless their hearts, the Italian army and the Austro-Hungarian army, neither one were very good, but they still fought brutally along the frontiers of, of each one of their areas and I'm trying to remember, and the Asanso River is the main river in this area. I'm trying to remember how many battles of the Asanso there were. There, I, there were literally like 12 or 13 battles of the Asanso uh, that they just fought back and forth uh, for. And so uh, I don't think in the grand scheme it would have made much difference because even if those Austro-Hungarian forces had been able to go back to the Eastern Front against the Soviets, the Austro-Hungarian forces were not very effective anyway. Germany was having to pull most of the weight oh, uh, I see. on when, that front. I think I may have missed some context. Uh, let's see. What if Italy remained neutral and America under Wilson kept its promise not to join the war? Would the Central um, Powers have won or lost still? Oh, so if the oh, Americans didn't go in? Yeah, oh. Yeah. Oh, that's, now that's a... That's the great question. <laughs> Sorry about that, Josh. I saw yeah. the, the revised um, version. <laughs> So, but it still applies because yeah. uh, your question about Italy, I would say, is a moot point. Italy yeah. doesn't really <laughs> play into the chessboard too much. They're just kind of there. Uh, the United They're kind of like a pawn. Yeah. If you kinda, will. yeah. The pawn kinda. of the chessboard. Um, America, though. Well, yes. So Now that is a big what the, if. The Entente and the Central Powers were both so spent by 1918, let's pretend America had never gotten into the war. Um, Germany had one great effort left to try to, uh, uh, for the, um, after the, so the Soviets, the Russians under a new Soviet regime left the war. They were able to transfer so many of their forces from the Eastern Front to the Western Front for uh, Operation Michael, which was the last big push, which was very successful and took the French and the English off guard uh, so much that if it hadn't been for the Americans that were already in, in Europe and there weren't that many to plug those holes, Operation Michael might have succeeded. But Germany was spent. It might not have had enough to push forward, but it may have been enough to force the Entente to a negotiated peace. Maybe. Because the French offensive capability was over. The British... Okay, I'm going... Here, here's my final answer, Josh. I think Germany might have won. Because France and Britain and Russia were out of money. And, the yeah. only, and, and their, their credit in America was spent. The only reason they got more money to finance the war was because America became a belligerent. If America hadn't become a belligerent, France and, and, and England literally would have run out of money, couldn't pay their soldiers, couldn't make shells for the artillery, and the jig is up. That's it. Gone. Done. In a nutshell, that's my take. Yes, like Germany it. would have won. <laughs> or I, and when I say won, it would have been a negotiated peace where they kept some of Belgium, and that's it. It's not like an overwhelming massive victory. It is very much a negotiated compromise peace between the Entente and the Central Powers. Now, if they got part of Belgium, do you think that they would have been been fine, been left alone, no World War II? This is, this is Glenn's great controversial history <laughs> take. If Germany had won the First World... Let me rephrase that. If Germany had won the Great War, 
there's not a World War II. Yeah, yeah. Freed actually just said so. Yeah. World War II could have been avoided, is what you're saying. I yeah. am. I, 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 part of me thinks very strongly that the Central Powers in Germany should have won World War One. It was Wilson. Ooh, Wilson. It was Wilson's interfering nature that got him involved <laughs> and caused the French and the British to do the things that led Germany uh, to be able to justify the Second World War. If, if America had stayed out of it, negotiated peace, Belgium turns German, and that's about it. And there is no... Um, there's no rise of Hitler. There's no stab in the back theory. There's none of that that happens. And I don't know. That's again, it's, it's and what it's, would have happened in the last like 70 years. That would have been so different. Right. It's, yeah. Right. And this is the big, I mean, seriously, this is probably my favorite. What if of the 20th century is what if Germany had won the great war Ugh, yeah. and they were, they were very close, even with America in, they were very close. Um, uh, and, and, I guess Glenn should go on the record as saying they should have won. Things would have turned out a lot better. It, wait, they should have won. Oh, they right, should, right. Germany the, should have won the Great yeah, War. Yeah, because the Great War leads to World War. Yeah, II and, I mean it yeah. does. Rise of Hitler. Yeah, and all yeah. Of that. I got gotcha. you. What do you, Fried? What do you? Th I mean, what do you think? You've you've gone through the German public education system. <laughs> what sort of, uh, you know, like, their take. Fried yeah, does say uh, winning wasn't necessary. Oh, Not absolutely losing would have sufficed, yeah, if you ask me. Right. Yeah. Like I said, that they could have gone to a negotiation table and said, "Okay, uh, no one wins. And that's no what, one loses." Before yeah. America got in, Wilson was trying to convince everyone to negotiate on the basis of peace without victory, oh. right? So that one side or the other could not declare victory, they simply would have said, the war is over. And which which I think is what Freed's talking about, right? It's not not absolutely losing. Right. But yeah. for some reason, everyone decided that Germany was the absolute worst loser oh. in World War One, which is still just <laughs> very and confusing. Clemenceau and Wilson. Oh. How they just decided oh. that. <laughs> uh, Richard also mentions that Germany in World War One was a lot different was from lot, Germany was, in yes. World War Two. It so keep that in mind, folks. Thing. It's a different thing. Yeah, whole and different thing. Whole Freedom. different government system. Yeah, different set of everything. Yeah. Freed mentions uh, a white a white peace would have been fine. I wonder though how the monarchy would have influenced Germany and Europe's history. Had I it mean that's place. that's a good question yeah. too, <laughs> right? Because you still at that if, when I say Germany should have won, they're going to win it in 1918, which means Russia has still gone Bolshevik. Yeah. And um, Germany, uh, I I wonder if a um, if a Germany under the Ho Hohenzollerns wouldn't have hated the Soviet Union even more <laughs> than Germany under the Nazis. Because mm. they... Mm, no. Now, um, <laughs> <laughs> Olivia brought up a question last last time that I, that I noticed just now that uh, she asks, you know, it seems like during World War II we were buddy buddies with the Soviet Union because they were fighting on the yes, same yeah. side. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Right. Now, were we already like not cool with the Soviet Union? Like what's going on with the with our relationship we, in the oh. a little frosty. We we end. actually sent troops in night and this is world you know, the Great War doesn't end. Let me rephrase that. Fighting doesn't end with the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. There's okay. still a lot of violence and activity going on. The United States and Great Britain send fighting forces to Russia to assist the white armies. Um, uh, but they don't do very well, and the, and the Bolsheviks continue, and they take over the country. Um, oh. Is it or just too big? <laughs> it's it's <laughs> too, too big. big. Of a topic. Oh, and I see Fried said uh, <laughs> Wilhelm was a pretty incapable monarch. Yes, but or incompetent. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, well, I think incapable and incompetent yes. are both good words. <laughs> that is true. That is true. But his but the crown prince seemed like a pretty a pretty decent, pretty competent guy, right? Um, I can't. What, what was his name? I can't remember. I just the crown prince. Uh, it wasn't Wilhelm. It was someone else but but the crown prince and a lot of folks inside imperial germany were like god if we if we if we can just make it through wilhelm if we can just get through wilhelm 
his son's going to be great. His son's going to be everything we want in a Kaiser, right? We just got to get him, but they couldn't get through Wilhelm. Mm. He had some uh, chip on his shoulder issues. Yeah. Perhaps. <laughs> he was JFK. <laughs> Wait, that was the Austrian <laughs> one. Yes. 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 That's what Freed says. Yes, that was, that's, that, that's what got this whole thing going. <laughs> Franz Joseph. Uh, now, Richard uh, mentions the Red Scare of the 1920s. Um, how does this how does this connect? What was the Red Scare of the 1920s? Um, you want to do this one? I, I can start it off. Okay, you start so, it off. So, <laughs> 1920s, right? Roaring 20s, lots of fun stuff. Lots, of, yeah, got, <laughs> got all that good Charleston vibes going in there. But also, <laughs> turmoil. Uh, also, Red Scare because Russia at this point has gone. Gone, gone red, okay. right? They've gone communist. Oh, or they're going okay, more okay, communist. Got it. Um, which is kind of the whole start. We aren't in a Cold War necessarily yet with them because that doesn't come until World War II when we both have nuclear weapons and can obliterate each other in a blink of an eye. Um, that's when... Well, it takes like 20 minutes, Murray. Come on. Okay. <laughs> it's not a blink of an eye. You know. It takes 20 well, minutes. when you push the button and start the whole thing, it's kind of hard to stop it. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, we aren't to a Cold War yet, but there are definitely anti-communist uh one of the whole reasons america gets into the first world war is to make the world safe for democracy and that's kind of wilson's idea of diplomatic diplomacy and international diplomacy is to make the world safe for democracy whatever that means so we are very pro-democracy once Will wilson kind of says that and sets us on that path which means we are anti literally anything anti-democratic including communism so basically we kind of start we don't like start the cold war because cold war is very specific to like nuclear weapons but we start not liking russia more in the 1920s i see okay and, so it kind of and, a, and a lot of western <laughs> countries do too because the great war because of the uh, economic turmoil the, the deaths all the things that that brought there was a lot of sympathy and movement for at least democratic socialism if not outright communism in France and England and Germany um, and the former multiple republics of the uh, uh, well the current republics of the former Austro-Hungarian Empire <laughs> and in the United States and so there was this red scare that because of the post-war turmoil these uh, for the the political forces of communism were going to somehow take over governments not even violently like the Bolsheviks had done but just through elections, elections. And, and then and so everyone and the red scare is not limited to to the united states mm -hmm. we think of it because we do u.s history but all those european countries that had survived yeah. uh the great war have that red scare going on and the you know the great big scary enemy is the soviet union where mm. it had actually come to pass and had taken a violent turn to it as well yeah. which everyone wants to avoid more violence after right. world war one no one that it was the everyone thought it was the war to end all wars like how more violent can you get you right. much yeah, world war two right. <laughs> but uh atom bombs nuclear right. weapons as they yeah. said world war one was the war to end all wars world war two is the war to get them back going again yeah, <laughs> yeah really <laughs> uh, but yeah no one wants more violence after world war one really everyone has very much lost their taste for that even though all of the instability that world war one had caused does which, in turn lead to violence which is why you get appeasement in the 1930s that being said um i know it is a very american thing to make fun of the french and the british <laughs> for appeasing the germans um and i felt that way too until i did i have actually gotten to go to normandy by the way oh, cool. uh, with a group of um of world war ii vets in my time in england and i went i wanted specifically to go to these cool little villages out in the middle you know the rural villages and i really and as i did i noticed that every single one of them has a monument in the middle of town um mort pour la france right died for france mm. or in england you know died for england yeah and every small town no matter how small has this monument and there are a lot of names on those yeah. monuments in yeah. those small towns and i'm like you know what if I had lived through this or I had been a child during this and looking back, yeah, 
I would want to avoid this yeah. at almost any cost. Right. It's it's not cowardly appeasement. It's dear Lord, we can't go through this again. Yeah. One generation later, we yeah. can't. Because there was a whole the lost generation, a whole generation of men who were in theory and in practice missing. Yeah. The, there were so many women who, at that time, was. It, you know, it starts to change in the 1920s where a woman could actually go out and, like, make it on her own, in part because there was no men to marry. <laughs> right. Right. Like, yeah. there was, there, that wasn't an they, option. What are we going to do now? <laughs> they kind of had to compete for the men that were left, right? Yeah. And so they had to, to do that women's lib, high skirt, look at my ankles, <laughs> aren't I interesting? I so mean, that's, that's not, that's not all well, they it didn't was have about. To, but then they could also make it on their own because there right. weren't enough men to do jobs. Right. So they're like, okay, we'll hire you. There's no one else. Yeah. That's a good um, connection. Yeah. yeah. It, it, so it's, but uh, I think there's just a line from Downton Abbey that I really love that Sybil says, and it's, at, you know, during the war, and she just, you know, gets a letter that says one of her friends has died. Oh. Um, and she says, it's like all of the men that I have ever danced with are dead. Yeah. Oh, because yeah. they they were in this high society, you know, you go out to these balls, you go out to dances, or even if you're not in the high society, you still go out to dances and you go out to like, right. you know, you have your church and your community. And there are whole towns where that well, generation of men are gone yeah. even, even and never coming back. Even Tolkien, right? There's a letter that he wrote uh, shortly after coming back, and it's heart-wrenching. I'm about to tear up just thinking oh. about it. But all of his friends from school uh, and his literary clubs and things mm-hmm. like that, and he's writing a letter, and he's like, every childhood friend that I had is dead but me. I literally am the last one. And, you know, there's this picture of him with his school chimes, and he's gone through, and the, and the, it is. He's the only one left. And that has a marked influence, not just on his fantastic literature, but on that entire generation. Yeah. And in part, why this is so bad, why your entire class is gone, is because you were not mixed up when they assigned you into your unit. Mm-hmm. Your unit was your hometown unit. Oh, wow. I and didn't Especially for the British. That was, wow. that was a British recruiting... You can gimmick, go to right? war with all your friends and your family. Oh, Isn't that great? I see. Yeah. You, because these people haven't been from far from home ever. Yeah, right. Like, or, I mean, most of them haven't. Right. Um, so when so, second, become, you know, yeah. second company, second battalion, the uh, Seaforth Highlanders goes out and they're all buddies and they and they take 80% casualties, then that town, takes the town takes casualties. 80% casualties. And Richard. So makes then a they good decided point. that was a bad idea and they shouldn't <laughs> yes, do that anymore. Right. <laughs> so then they uh, stopped putting everyone from the same town in the same unit right. after right. World War One because towns were devastated. Yeah, and Richard makes a point that and the men who were left were also racked by shell shock oh. and you know what we well, would know as PTSD and right. trauma to this day. Well, so. not uh, not all of them, but it was a of course yeah. it was a high percentage, and we're not sure because that was the first. During that, during the Great War, was the first medical recognition, even if it was reluctant, that such that what we call today PST, even was a thing, to to recognize how to recognize it. They had no idea how right. to treat it. Right, yeah. they had none. Yeah. Um, but anyway, they realized it was a problem, though. Well, what a happy note to and conclude on today. Hooray. Yay! <laughs> no, thanks for thanks for hanging out with us, y'all. I do want to remind you that we have. Um, tomorrow, you can join Marie for her winter fashions of the Victorian era. That is tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern. And, um, of course, we encourage you to become a digital member because we have our digital member holiday sale going on until December 24th. This also makes an awesome gift for the history buffs in your life. So, uh, we look forward to our next lo-fi history in, uh, whenever that's going to be next month. <laughs> and yes. And again, uh, thanks to everyone who joined us for our telethon. If you didn't get a chance to check out the telethon, just go to our YouTube channel and you can catch up there. But we had a lot of uh, great programs and uh, we we exceeded our donation goal. I think it might be. uh, We got some donations afterwards. So I think we're at like we were pushing thirty five hundred thirty five. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you all so much for your support. And um yeah, so we hope to see you again soon. Thanks so much for hanging out. That'll, it'll be January, right? Yes, it'll so be January. So happy holidays Whoa, and happy new right, year, everyone. It'll right. be 2022. Yeah, so we'll see you in 2022. Bye. <laughs> All right, bye, everybody.